So we talked last time about kind of how all the blood vessels connect, and then this time we're going to talk about how the blood actually flows through these vessels. Okay. Um, now, if we were to consider a single vessel, imagine it could be an artery, vein, doesn't really matter. If you were to take a single vessel and you were to cut this guy, so imagine this could be any vessel in the body, and we did a cross section through the vessel like this, what we would find is that there's a couple of different layers, and all vessels are going to have these same basic layers. The inside, the, like the inner wall of the blood vessel, is made up of a single layer of epithelial cells, simple squamous epithelium. Remember that? Like that was one of the examples where you find simple squamous epithelium is on the inside of a blood vessel. And so squamous cells are super thin, right? And they're just these puny little flat cells that provide this smooth kind of surface of, of for motion, all right, in the blood vessel. This inner layer uh, that I just drew, his name is called the tunica intima. So I'm gonna draw a little arrow pointing to him. This is the tunica intima. And he consists of a single layer of simple squamous epithelium. And there's also a couple elastic fibers that wrap around it. It just helps support it. But it's a really thin puny layer. layer. Okay. Then the next layer that you'll have is a layer. Actually, you guys are gonna kill me. I'm gonna change the color of the tunica intima to purple. Doesn't really matter. Okay. The next layer is called the tunica media, and this is actually a layer that's mostly composed of smooth muscle. And these muscle fibers are gonna wrap around that tunica intima like this. So you're gonna have these muscle fibers that kind of encase that tunica intima. This is called the tunica media. And um, the function of these muscle fibers is that it allows our body to kind of control the diameter of all these vessels. So if those muscle fibers contract, what happens to the size of the inner tube of the vessel, up or down? Down, it goes down, right? And so if it goes down, is that gonna allow more blood to flow through or less blood? Less, right? The smaller the tube, the less blood that can move through it. And that's really important because this allows us to control where blood goes in the body. Like for example, if we want, um, if we're exercising, we're gonna want more blood to go to our major muscles of like our legs and our arms, you know, all those things that are moving around. So those arteries that feed blood to those tissues are going to get bigger, right? That smooth muscle is gonna relax. It allows that vessel to get bigger so more blood can go through it. In the same sense, if we're, you know, exercising, we want less blood to go to our skin. And so we're gonna contract those vessels so it's smaller, less blood can go through it, and it can go all far, okay? So that's really important. So the tunica media allows us to control kind of where blood goes. You're also gonna have some elastic fibers in the tunica media as well. Now this outermost um, layer, this layer, I'll kind of draw this and this shade it in in this kind of brown color. This outer layer is called the tunica externa. So right here, oh, this is kind of clear. This is tunica externa. And what this is, is this is like a protective case around the vessel, contains a lot of collagen, okay? And in our largest vessels, you're actually gonna have um, small capillaries that go through the tunica externa because it's so large that those cells need, you know, fuel, okay? So that's the basic plan for all vessels. And obviously the blood is in here, okay? Um, and so that's the basic kind of construction of all the vessels that we have in our body, both arteries and veins. Now, what we'll do is we are gonna kind of trace the, or we're gonna follow the, um, the pattern that vessels take as they leave the heart, go to the smallest vessels in our body, the capillaries, and then make the return trip back to the heart through the veins. As soon as blood leaves the heart, it gets pumped out of the left ventricle, right? And that left ventricle is gonna pump blood into the aortic arch. 
okay? Largest artery of the body. This aortic arch, which kind of curves around and becomes the abdominal aorta, this is called an elastic artery. So an elastic artery is our largest kind of artery in the body, or it's an example of the largest arteries in the body, and they're big, okay? So this would be like the large aorta that leaves the, um, actually I'm starting pain. All right, so these are like the large arteries that leave the heart. Um, what do you think they have a lot of them? What do you think they contain a lot of based on their name? Elastic fibers, all right? So they just contain a lot of elastic fibers and allows them to stretch. This ability to stretch is really important because when the um, left ventricle contracts, he causes the pressure to skyrocket in these arteries. Right, in the elastic arteries. Because they're elastic, when pressure goes up, they stretch and they expand like a balloon. The cool thing that happens is that when the heart relaxes, okay, that heart relaxes and the um, stretched artery wants to recoil. Well, as it recoils, it wants to push blood back into the heart. That's not gonna happen because there's a valve there. What valve kind of prevents it from going back into the left ventricle? A, yeah, semi-lunar aortic valve, right? Aortic valve specifically, but that semi-lunar valve is gonna close. So that artery is still expanded, he's squeezing. Blood can't go into the semilunar, and so it's pushed downstream into the smaller vessels. So the elasticity of that artery allows the blood to be pumped through the system even when the heart's relaxing. If like the arteries were PVC pipes that didn't expand, the blood, the flow of blood through the arteries would be like start, stop, start, stop, you know, because it would only be propelled by the heart beating. But because they stretch and expand, the blood flow is more continuous, which is better for our system. As we get older, right, some of the elasticity of the arteries decreases, we lose some of that. And then, um, especially like chronic hypertension, if you're experiencing like high blood pressure for a long period of time, you lose some of that elasticity. And so the blood flow becomes more discontinuous. And that's not as efficient, makes your heart work a little harder. So that's the kind of significance of that elasticity. The diameter of these guys is about a centimeter and a half. So we'll say one, yeah. So we'll say 15 millimeters in diameter. That's the width of those arteries. Pretty big. Like our aorta is this big. You know, as big as a marker. So it's a, it's a very large vessel. Now, um, the elastic arteries, they are going to split into smaller arteries as they leave the heart. These smaller arteries are called muscular arteries. Okay. Um, these guys are smaller, maybe like five or six millimeters in diameter. What do you think they contain a lot of based on their name? Muscle. Yeah, smooth muscle. These guys have the highest proportion of smooth muscle compared to any other um, vessel. Basically, all those arteries that you got to learn the names of, like the brachial, the radial, the ulnar, the femoral, these are all muscular arteries. Okay, so all the ones you got to learn the name of, aside from like the largest abdominal aorta and the aortic arch, those are elastic, but everybody else is muscular. They contain a lot of this smooth muscle in the tunica media, and that allows them to control where blood goes. It also allows them to control things like blood pressure, which we'll, which we'll talk about the significance of. These guys, they're gonna split up into smaller tubes, which are actually significantly smaller. All right, the smaller tubes that branch out of these muscular arteries are called arterioles. A-R-T-E-R-I-O-L-E. -E. These guys are a lot smaller than the muscular arteries. These guys are only four one hundredths of a millimeter, so 40 micrometers. So their diameter would be 0 0.04 millimeters. So like pretty darn small. They contain all these layers, right? Contain a little bit of smooth muscle, a little bit of collagen, Definitely the tunica intima. And they're still carrying blood away. 
Now finally, these guys are going to branch out into our smallest vessels in the body. Smallest vessels in the body are our capillaries. You guys remember the diameter of a red blood cell? Eight micrometers. Eight micrometers. All right, that's good. So, what's the diameter of a capillary? About the same, exactly the same. Eight micrometers. Remember, I drew that like single file line of red blood cells going through the capillary. Um, so the diameter of the capillaries is eight micrometers, or zero point zero zero eight millimeters. Really small. Okay. Um, the important thing about the capillaries is this is the only place in our cardiovascular system where things are allowed or things should leave and enter the vessels. Okay, so in other words, like the blood and the elastic arteries, muscular and arterioles, they should stay in those vessels. If they leave the vessels, you've got a hemorrhage, you've got like internal bleeding. But when they get to the level of the capillaries, the capillaries have these little holes in them. Those holes are called fenestrations, or sometimes clefts is another word for it. That permits the fluid to leave the blood, which leave the, um, the vessels, the capillaries, which it absolutely should, because these capillaries are at the level of the tissues that need things like oxygen and glucose. So all that fluid, that plasma is gonna leak out with all that oxygen and fuel and um, hormones, and those are going to interact with the tissues, okay? And then the capillaries are gonna pick that fluid back up and take it back to the heart. On the return trip, the first vessels that start to take this blood back to the heart, I'm gonna draw these guys in blue because these are like the first veins. The first tiny little veins are called venules. V-E-N-U-L-E. -E. These guys are small but they're bigger than capillaries, about half the size of arterioles. So their diameter is 0 0.02 millimeters. And they're starting to carry blood back to the heart. They contain all these layers, right? They contain tunica intima, media, and externa. This is really important. The capillaries, I should have mentioned this a minute ago, Capillaries only contain the tunica intima. They're the only vessel that only they, they're a vessel that only consists of this inner layer. So all they are is just a single tube made up of simple squamous epithelium, a single layer of simple squamous epithelium, reinforced with a little bit of elastic fibers. They don't have any smooth muscle, and they don't have any um, kind of tunica externa, any outer covering that supports them. All the other vessels have all three layers. The venules are then going to combine with one another and they're going to form these larger vessels that carry blood back to the heart. These are our veins. Surprise, surprise. And they range in diameter. Some of our largest veins are about a centimeter in diameter, so 10 millimeters. So who's, who's, thick, who's um, wider, the aortic arch or the inferior vena cava? Well, like, typically, I think the aortic arch is the biggest, right? So he's the biggest one at 15 millimeters, and the vena cava are a little bit smaller, right around, you know, just, but still very large vessel. Okay, now, what we need to do is, unfortunately, we need to talk about a little bit of math to talk about how blood moves through a system of vessels. And there's two ways that you can tackle these equations. If the equations help you, if the equations like make sense to you, that's great, use them. If they don't, all you have to do is memorize the take home messages that the equations predict. Does that kind of make sense? So if the equations confuse you, all you have to do is memorize the take home messages. First equation we're gonna talk about is this guy. And he shows that F is equal to delta P, delta just means the change in P over R. F is blood flow. 
This is the amount of blood that's flowing through a system of tubes or pipes, like our cardiovascular system. Delta P is the change in pressure. Or the difference in pressure. And that's the difference in pressure at one location of this system of tubes versus the other location. Or if you have a tube, it's the difference in pressure from one location to the other. And then R is resistance. So based on this equation, all right, if you were to increase delta P, what happens to F? Up or down? Yeah. If delta P goes up, he goes up. And I mean, the simple way of looking at this, imagine delta P is 1, R is 1. 1 divided by 1 is what? 1, right? If you change this 1 to a 2, 2 divided by 1 is 2, right? So if this goes up, that goes up. This is how you can think of this. So imagine that you, um, you got a coffee, right? You bring a coffee to class. It is like a large iced coffee. And you want to sip it super slow and make it last the entire class, okay? Are you going to, like, take these, like, big, huge gulps through the straw, or are you just going to take these tiny little sips? Tiny little sips. In order to make a tiny little sip where you sip it super slow, um, you're just going to cause a subtle drop in pressure in your mouth. Like, you're just going to, you know, like, you're not going to, you know, like, suck really hard on the straw type thing. You're just going to cause, like, a subtle little drop in pressure in your mouth. And due to that subtle little drop in pressure, the pressure in your mouth is a little bit lower than the pressure in the coffee, and so fluid's gonna travel up the straw, okay? And you're gonna sip it super slow. That difference in pressure from your mouth to the coffee, that's delta P. And then F is how much coffee goes up the straw. All right, so a little change in pressure, a little bit of flow. Now imagine you bring that same coffee to a class, but you realize like, I don't know, the um, the professor that, that is teaching this class like does not allow coffee in his class and he's like a jerk and if he sees coffee he makes you like dump it out like right before class starts so you got this huge five dollar coffee you, you see him like walking down the hall him or her and you're like I don't want to lose this coffee so you like chug it as fast as you can okay in this situation are you gonna create like a subtle drop in pressure in your mouth or are you gonna like try to drink it super fast and suck really hard Right, super fast. So you're going to cause like a very dramatic drop in pressure in your mouth through the contraction of all of those muscles of your throat and mouth, right? The pressure is going to go way down in your mouth versus the coffee cup and what's going to happen to blood flow or coffee flow. It's going to go way up, right? So a bigger difference in pressure between your mouth and your coffee causes coffee to fly through that straw at a higher rate, okay? That's kind of how blood flow works. That's going to come into play. Does it depend on the size of of the vessel? It does. And that's where this guy comes in. So resistance is R. If resistance goes up, what happens to blood flow according to that equation? It goes down, right? So imagine this is 1, 1. If you change R to 2, that's 1 half. It goes down, okay? Resistance depends on a couple of different things. Resistance, think of resistance as the friction that a fluid experiences in a tube. Just the friction that it experiences as it drags along the inner walls of the tube. The more resistance, the harder it is for that fluid to move through the tube. Resistance is affected by a couple of different things. One thing that affects resistance is the viscosity of the fluid. That's how sticky or thick it is. Like honey has a very high viscosity, okay? Versus water has a lower viscosity. Who would be easier to drink through a straw, honey or water? Water, like, because honey's thick, okay? Well, as, res as viscosity goes up, resistance goes up, if resistance goes up, blood flow goes, or flow goes down. Our blood stays about the same viscosity for the most part. If we get really dehydrated, viscosity goes up a little bit. And so if we're really dehydrated, what happens to blood flow, up or down? Down, because resistance went up a little bit, blood flow went down a little bit. Another thing that affects resistance in a more dramatic way is the length of a tube, okay? So longer tubes experience or exert more resistance on a fluid. And that makes sense, it's just a longer tube, more friction. What's 
easier to drink out of a normal length straw or like one of those super long crazy straws super like a normal length straw okay so the shorter the tube the lower the resistance the higher the flow this doesn't really become a factor in our daily lives but as we grow older it does so kids have shorter vessels okay like they are shorter and so they have shorter tubes that's lower resistance and they that's gonna um, factor in in fact it has a direct effect on their blood pressure which we'll talk about here in a minute blood pressure of a kid is it typically higher or lower than adult lower right like if you yeah it's lower like my, my eight-year-old he went and he got his blood pressure taken because they are my nine-year-old because they do that now and his blood pressure was like 90 over 60 or something and that's normal like if you were to take a blood pressure even on a smaller kid it's super low and um we'll talk about why here in a little bit but you're going to rearrange this equation and it'll 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 predict exactly why okay all right so but it has so it, it's all about the length of those tubes the biggest influence on resistance though is the diameter of a tube okay and the, the width of a tube has huge influences on resistance. That's because the radius of a tube scales with the, um, no, 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 let me back up. The resistance of a tube scales with the radius of that tube to the fourth power. You don't have to remember this, okay? What this means is that if you change the radius or the diameter of a tube a little bit okay let's say you make it a little bit thinner what effect does that have on resistance up or down increases it by it, fourfold yeah it increases it to the fourth power so if you make a tube just a little bit thinner the resistance skyrockets to the fourth power if you make a tube a little bit wider resistance is going to plummet to the fourth power so subtle changes in the diameter of a tube have huge effects on resistance so let's say there's an artery and smooth muscle contracts, makes it a little bit thinner. What happens to resistance, up or down? Up, but way up, okay? If resistance goes way up, what happens to the blood flow in that artery? Way down, okay? So just remember that. All right, now another way, uh, let's think about this. Do you get into plaque at all? What's that? Do you get into plaque? Nah. Well, so that, that's going to definitely affect uh, resistance as well. So if she, what she's talking about is like plaque that can build up in your arteries. If plaque builds up in your arteries, that's going to have a, a decrease in the diameter of that vessel, okay? Which is going to cause resistance to do what? Skyrocket, which is going to decrease the blood flow in that vessel. If the blood flow in that vessel is decreased, the heart's going to have to work harder and pump blood even you know, more forcefully through that vessel to achieve the same cardiac output. So it's just gonna put strain on your heart, which is gonna cause blood pressure to skyrocket as well, all right? So we'll kind of relate all this um, here in a second. Now, um, we can rearrange this equation a little bit and talk about how blood pressure changes in different situations. Blood flow is equivalent to cardiac output, okay? And that makes sense. Like the blood flow in your cardiovascular system is equal to how much blood comes out of your left ventricle in a given amount of time. So we can say that F is equal to cardiac output. Do you guys remember the equation for cardiac output? Heart rate times strip volume, right? Remember that from last time? So cardiac output is just heart rate times stroke volume, okay? So we can rewrite this equation right here by saying that if F is equal to CO is equal to HR times SV, we can rewrite it as HR times SV equals delta P over R, okay? If we solve for delta P, we just move R over here. That means that delta P equals heart rate times stroke volume times resistance, okay? This is a cool equation because delta P is 
another way of thinking about just blood pressure in your arteries, okay? So if delta P is blood pressure, right here, what happens to blood pressure if you increase heart rate? Well, then it yeah, it goes up, right? If this goes up, that goes up. If stroke volume goes up, what happens to blood pressure? It goes up. And if resistance goes up, what happens to blood pressure? It goes up, right? So like if any of these guys go up, blood pressure is going to go up. Remember that equation because that's going to be a good key for predicting how blood pressure changes in different situations. During exercise, your heart rate increases. What happens to blood pressure? Up, okay? Your contractility of the heart goes up. What happens to blood pressure? Your stroke volume goes up. Goes up. Those large arteries, like your elastic arteries, start to squeeze a little bit. What happens to blood pressure? Up, okay? Now remember that. Because that's going to allow us to predict some really important things. Okay, over here, I'm going to draw a graph. Okay. Oh, I hate to j jump around. Remember we're talking about kids, right? Kids have shorter vessels. How does that affect resistance? Yeah, so shorter vessels cause resistance to go down. If resistance goes down, what happens to blood pressure? Down. That's why kids have low blood pressure, essentially. Well. All right, so now I'm going to draw a graph, and this is the pressure that we experience in each one of these vessels. Turns out that if you have a closed system of tubes that's where the flow is driven by a pump. So you have a closed system of a pump that drives flow through these tubes. This could be like your, your sprinkler pump, your pool pump, whatever. Pressure is always highest right next to the pump. And then pressure decreases the further you get away. It's due to friction eating up the pressure. So, where is pressure going to be the highest in this situation? The elastic arteries, arterioles, veins? Yeah. Elastic, because that's right next to the pump, okay? So we'll say that the pressure in these elastic arteries are the highest. And do you think the pressure is like this constant level, or do you think it kind of fluctuates up and down? It fluctuates with each heartbeat, right? So the heart contract, right, and that's going to pump blood into the elastic arteries that causes pressure to go up, and then it goes down, and then up, and then down with each heartbeat and relaxation. So pressure is going to be highest here, and it fluctuates up and down. By the time we get to the muscular arteries, the pressure is starting to decrease, and those fluctuations are starting to even out because they're, you know, further away from the pump, okay? Let's say that this person that we're mapping out right here has a blood pressure that's like 120 over 80, okay? It's like a typical blood pressure. So we'll say 120 over 80. 120, that's the blood pressure when the heart contracts. And then 80, that's the pressure in the arteries when the heart's relaxed, and the units would be millimeters of mercury, okay? Another name for this, 120, is called systolic pressure, and then 80 is your diastolic. Does, do the elastic arteries ever experience a pressure that's lower than 80? Well, at this moment in time, no. Okay, so that's the lowest pressure that the, those arteries are going to experience. Um, and it goes up and down with each heartbeat. We should talk real quick about how this is measured. Like we get our blood pressure taken all the time, right? You have that little cuff that um, uh, goes around your, your, your arm. Okay, so someone like a nurse or whoever is going to take your blood pressure. They have a cuff, an inflatable cuff. They have a stethoscope that they put right here. They put that cuff around your arm and they pump that cuff up with pressure, like higher and higher pressure, okay? They might pump it up all the way to like 160 millimeters of mercury. And that cuff is right over your brachial artery. If your blood pressure is 120 over 80, and that cuff gets pumped all the way up to 160, what, should, what happens to your brachial artery? 
it's completely closed, completely collapsed. Because the pressure in the cup is greater than the highest pressure in the brachial artery, so that brachial artery slammed closed, okay? No blood's going through it. Then that person's gonna start, like, decrease the pressure in that cuff, right? So the pressure starts to go down, they'll, like, watch the little, the little meter, right, pressure meter, whatever that's called, and then it goes down, and then right around, like, 120, maybe 119, that person will see the needle, like, jump a little bit, and they might even hear a sound, like a little thud sound in their stethoscope. What's causing that thud sound? That's right. When the pressure in the cuff dips below 120, that means that the pressure in the artery is just high enough to squirt a little bit of blood through, right? And that squirt of blood, getting squirted through that artery, makes that sound, and it causes the needle to jump. So that person will mark down that number as your systolic pressure. Then the needle continues to go down, it continues to jump, bounce, bounce, bounce. And then around like 80 or 78, the needle stops bouncing and there's no sound. What, what, why did it stop making a sound? What's that? Back to normal. It's back to normal. The cuff, the pressure in the cuff is lower than the lowest pressure that the brachial artery experiences. So that brachial artery is wide open and blood's moving smoothly through that artery and there's no sound. Okay. Um, and so that's what happens. Now, by the time we get to the arterioles, the pressure really drops. It's gonna drop way down. By the time you get to the capillaries, the pressure is only about 35 millimeters per mercury. Continues to drop. By the time you leave the capillaries, it's at about 17. And then when you go to the veins, the venules in the veins, it continues to drop. By the time it gets to the vena cava, it's zero. Or by the time you get back to the heart, it's zero. Okay. Now, imagine that you wanted to come up with an estimate of kind of like a running average, like an average pressure in the arteries. You know, so this dotted line that kind of evens out those fluctuations. Um, the estimate for that value is called the mean arterial pressure. If you were to guess, what do you think that value would be? If somebody's blood pressure is 120 over 80. 90. Well, yes, good, because you know. But like, imagine you don't you don't know anything about MAP. I would guess 100, right? Because it's like halfway between 120 and 80. Turns out it's it's right. It's not exactly um, uh, 100. That's because mean arterial pressure is equal to diastolic pressure plus pulse pressure divided by three. Pulse pressure is pretty simple of calculation. It's just systolic minus diastolic. So in this case, what's diastolic pressure? 80, right? So it's 80. What's pulse pressure? 40. 40. Systolic minus diastolic, that's 40. Divided by 3 is like 13.3. 40 divided by 3 is like 13.3. So 80 plus 13.3 is like 93.3. Okay. So it's not exactly 100. Okay. Now, here's where all this kind of makes sense. Let's say that you need to exercise, or you're exercising. Okay. That means that we need to get the blood to our tissues faster. When we exercise, our arteries are going to contract a little bit. If they contract a little bit, what's going to happen to resistance? If they contract a little bit, it gets smaller, what happens to resistance, up or down? Up. If resistance goes up, what happens to blood pressure? Up. So now what we've done is that we've caused blood pressure to go from like here all the way up here to like 160. Blood pressure's still gonna drop by the time it gets to the capillaries. It still drops to about 35 or so. What have we done to the difference in pressure between the arteries and the capillaries? 
Have we increased it or decreased it? So the difference in pressure is the pressure here versus here. At rest, it was like uh, 93 to 35. Now it's like 150 to 35. Delta P has gone what? Up, right? If delta P goes up, what happens to blood flow? Up. So we're moving blood to the capillaries, the final destination, faster when blood pressure goes up. And that's the whole reason why blood pressure elevating during exercise is beneficial. Because if blood pressure goes up, it moves blood to our capillaries faster. And that's a great thing when we're exercising or when we're stressed, you know, like, like if you need, you know, extra, extra blood flow. But the problem is, is if you always experience high blood pressure, then it's hard on the heart, it makes the heart work harder for a long period of time, and that, and that can be problematic. And it also is just rough on the vessels because they experience those higher forces for a really long period of time and it starts to mess with their elasticity and all that. Okay. All right, we're gonna go break. That was a lot, right? It's, it's kind of tricky, but it's good. I mean, this is like some really good stuff that we're learning about. So let's go to break and we're almost done. And we only have one more like equation to talk about. And like I said, like this equation, if this confuses you, you know, you don't have to memorize this guy. You could just remember the fact that if heart rate goes up, blood pressure goes up. If stroke volume goes up, blood pressure goes up. If resistance goes up, blood pressure goes up. It's so like when we exercise, heart rate goes up, right? That's gonna cause blood pressure to go up. Now we have a bigger difference in pressure from here to here, blood's gonna move faster. And that's the whole idea. Okay, just remember that, yeah? Blood flow go down, yeah, so, you could just take this the opposite direction, right? So if heart rate goes down, right? Stroke volume goes down. If, if the arteries, you know, those, those big elastic arteries and some of these muscular arteries, if they just totally relax across the board, blood pressure goes down, okay? Now, injury can cause blood pressure to go down. Remember the connection between blood volume and blood pressure? So if blood volume goes up, what happens to blood pressure? Up, right? And you're like cramming more fluid into a balloon. Now, if you have a bad injury, like a really you know, nasty cut or something, and you lose a lot of blood, blood volume goes way down. If blood volume goes down, what does blood pressure do? Way down. That's a problem because now this is going down to here. And there's a smaller difference in pressure between the heart and the capillaries. Blood flow goes down. And so the body's like, this is a problem. We need to get blood pressure back up in response to a really dramatic loss of blood, like what do you think your heart's gonna do to compensate? Pump harder, pump faster, and what are the arteries gonna do? Squeeze, right? To help get that blood pressure back up. At the same time, like all those endocrine hormones, like aldosterone's gonna be released. And if we remember what aldosterone does, what does it do? He tells the kidneys to reabsorb salt and water full of salt. So basically he just tells the kidneys don't produce urine or much urine so that we can get that blood pressure back up, okay? But that's really the reason why we want to keep blood pressure up, because we got to get that blood to the tissues. If this goes down, blood doesn't want to go to the tissues, you know, or it doesn't go as fast, okay? And that is a problem, okay? Now, all right, what we're going to do is we are going to zoom in on this capillary bed. We need to talk about this capillary bed a little bit more in detail. Um, so if I were to draw the capillary bed, we're going to have an arteriole, and this arteriole, when it gets to the tissues, is going to branch out like this into a bunch of smaller capillaries that are super small, super tiny, right? And you'll have this one kind of central vessel that kind of moves through the capillary bed like this, okay? And it kind of branches out in these smaller capillaries. These guys converge into these smaller venules, which are then going to leave carry this blood back to the heart, okay? So capillary spinules. Cool thing about this situation is that, um, there are these little sphincters. Now a sphincter is just a ring of muscle that encases a tube and it'll constrict and it'll make that tube smaller. There are these little sphincters that hang out right here at the base of each one of these little capillaries. 
And if we want blood to go through all of these little capillaries, those sphincters relax. And so, you know, the diameter of the capillary gets bigger, blood can go through. If we want blood to completely bypass that capillary bed, those sphincters contract, and the blood is just redirected through the central vessel, no exchange occurs. And so this will happen in the skin. You know, if we don't want the blood to, uh, you know, lose oxygen to the cells or lose as much oxygen to the cells of our, like our skin cells, those sphincters will contract, blood is just forced through the central cavity, and um, no exchange occurs, okay? But let's say that these sphincters are relaxed and blood is moving through the capillaries. What is the magnitude of blood pressure at the beginning of the capillary beds? 35. 35, okay. So blood pressure is 35 here. We'll do purple. It's 35 here. So which direction is that blood pressure pushing the blood? Out of the capillaries or into the capillaries? Mm -hmm. Out. Okay, so think of blood pressure is always pushing out. And that makes sense, like pressure in a vessel is pushing out. Okay, so like if you have pressure in a balloon, if you open up the balloon, the air comes out. Okay, like high pressure always pushes out. So blood pressure pushes out. So we have 35 going out, okay? What's the magnitude of blood pressure at the end of the capillary bed? 17, and that's going out too, okay? So it's 17 over here, it's dropped a little bit. There's another pressure that is at play here. And this other pressure is called the colloid osmotic pressure. I'm gonna write that down. And I'm gonna draw this guy in green. So in green is the colloid osmotic pressure. Do you guys remember, we were talking about the blood, remember those big proteins like albumin that are in the blood and their whole job is just to balance out osmotic pressure? Okay, they're like placeholders. Well, due to the presence of these proteins, they're constantly like pulling fluid into the blood, just due to osmosis, okay? It's a constant pressure. If they're pulling fluid into the blood, is that pressure inwards or outwards? Inwards, right? So colloid osmotic pressure is pulling things into the vessels. The magnitude of this colloid osmotic pressure is about always 25, about 25 in the, in the capillary bed. So it's 25 here, and it's 25 here. If you've got two pressures that are going in different directions, you can add those guys up and get the net pressure. It's kind of like your bank account. Imagine this is your bank account at one day. You're making $25, that's 25 inward, but you're spending $35. What's the net kind of gain or loss? 10, a loss of 10. So here, the net filtration pressure, and I'm gonna do this in black, this is the net filtration, that's just the total filtration pressure. That's just the total pressure. is 10, but going out at the start of the capillary beds. Does that make sense to everybody? Because 35 is bigger than 25, and 35 is going out. So we got 10 going out here. What's the net filtration pressure at the end of the capillary bed? Eight, going which direction? Yeah. In, perfect. So here it's eight going in. So this is perfect if you think about it. At the beginning of the capillary bed, the net pressure is pushing the fluid out. That's exactly what we want the fluid to do. We want it to leave the capillaries so that all that oxygen and glucose can interact with all the surrounding cells and tissues, okay? So we want that fluid to leave the capillaries at the beginning. Then, after a period of time, we want that fluid to get recollected back into the capillaries. Because if it didn't, if we were just pushing blood out and we never recollected it back into the vessels, our blood volume would go to zero in like two seconds and we would die. So we need a way of getting it back in. At the end of the capillary beds, the net pressure is inwards, so it sucks it all back up. So it pushes it out and then it sucks it all back up. That's perfect. And while the fluids interact with the tissues, all the cells are happy, tons of oxygen, tons of glucose, hormones, all that stuff. But what's the problem? There's a difference. There's a difference. You're pushing out more than you're sucking back up. 
Okay, there's a leftover. We have a whole system of tubes that we'll talk about after the next test called the lymphatic system. Their whole goal, their whole job, is to collect that leftover fluid. Because if they didn't exist, we would swell up within minutes and we would die. You know, so we need a way of recollecting that stuff. And, and that's important. Okay. All right. Um, where do you think blood flow is faster in the capillaries? Where do you think blood is moving faster? In the capillaries or the, or the aorta? It's moving a lot faster in the aorta. It has to move super slow in the capillaries so that there's time for exchange to occur. Okay. Another reason that it moves so slow is that there's a very interesting relationship between surface area and velocity when we're talking about a system of tubes. Where do you guys, so surface area, when we're talking about this, relates to the cross-sectional surface area. That's the area of this circle inside a vessel, okay? Where do you think there's more surface area? If you were to measure the surface area of the aorta, or you were to add up all the individual surface areas of all the capillaries, which one has a greater surface area? The aorta or the collectively all the capillaries? Aorta. You'd think the aorta, because the aorta's big and the capillaries are so small. The problem is we have so many of these tiny capillaries that if you were to measure the surface area of each capillary and then add them up over all the hundreds of thousands of different capillaries we have, or millions really, turns out that the surface area of the capillaries equals 2,500 times the surface area of the aorta. So there's the capillaries have 2,500 times more surface area than the aorta. If that you get confused by that, just forget that equation. Just think about it. There's a lot more surface area in the capillaries than there is the aorta because there's a lot of capillaries. Now, here's one more equation that I'm going to give you guys. And that predicts that it's, it's called the principle of continuity. What it predicts is that if you take the surface area at one location in the system of tube, you multiply the velocity of the fluid in that tube, it's going to be equal to the surface area at a second location times the velocity in a second location. Okay. Let me give you an example. Imagine that you're like a big white water rafting person. That's like your thing, you know? And you're on the search for like these new rapids. And you pull up Google Earth and you're like searching, but you found this new river or something, and you're searching for like where the rapids are gonna be the, the, the fastest, you know? And you're looking at this overhead map, and the, and the river looks like this, right? It kind of looks like this. That's the overhead view, aerial view of this river. And you've got water moving in this direction. You know, and it's just super zoomed out. Where do you think the water is moving the fastest? Or where do you think, yeah, water, where do you think water is moving the fastest? A, B, or C? The bottom. B. Okay, it's moving it to B. Okay. It's because of this. Where... If let's just consider A and B, where is surface area higher, A or B? A, right? I mean, look at all this surface area, cross-sectional surface area. So if we change this to A and B, we know that the surface area at A is huge. If you were to look at a river where it's really wide, is the water moving super fast or is it moving kind of slow? slow, right? So the surface area is huge, the velocity is little. The, the size of S and B represent the magnitude, right? Okay, what's the surface area at B? Super small, right? So the surface area at B is super small. In order for this side to be equal to that side, what does B have to do? It has to be huge, right? So B at B is huge. There's an inverse relationship between surface area and velocity. And that makes sense. You look at some rapids, the river's not very wide. That's why it's going fast. Okay? It has to speed up to get all that water through a smaller space. Now, if we look at the capillaries and the aorta, what's the surface area of the capillaries, huge or small? 
huge, right? So the surface area of the capillaries is huge. What's the velocity in the capillaries? Low. It has, it's very low, right? So the velocity of the capillaries is low. What's the surface area of the aorta comparatively? Super small. So the surface area of the aorta is small. What does the velocity have to be to make everything equal out? Huge. The velocity of the aorta has to be small. Okay. Um, this is, honestly, that was a lot of math. This is the take home for the test. Where does blood go faster, capillaries or aorta? Aorta, right? And it's because of the low surface area comparatively of the aorta. Okay. And that's good. Um, one more thing to talk about. We got a problem. By the time we leave the capillary beds, our pressure is down to 17 millimeters of mercury. Do you think that's enough pressure? to get the blood back to the heart. I mean, this could be a capillary bed in our big toe. Do you think that's enough to get it back? No. Like the heart is useless. He, put, he worked so hard to get the blood to the capillaries, but he's useless after that. How the heck does blood get back to the heart if the heart is completely useless? Just the pressure of more incoming fluid. That, that's a good idea. That's what you think. That's what I would always think, but it, it turns out it, it doesn't, right? All that incoming fluid is just dead in the water. Literally, it's just dead, right? There's, there's all the pressure's eaten up. Muscle. Yes. Okay. So it deals with muscles, and it deals with this. There's a couple of different ways that blood gets back to the heart. Collectively, this process is called the venous pump. Okay. It deals. It's based on a couple of different things. The first thing is the presence of one-way valves. In our veins, so here's a vein, okay? This could be like a large vein in your leg, great saphenous vein or something like that. And um, blood needs to go up. That's the opposite direction it wants to. Gravity's pulling it down. Blood pressure is hardly anything. Blood pressure's not helping us. But this blood needs to go up. So. What we'll find is that in this vein, there's a series of one-way valves that look like this. They're very similar to like, I don't know, your semi-lunar valves in some ways. So if blood enters one little section of this vein, you can't go down. That, that's helpful, All right? So that, that's the first stage of, of this process. When these valves start to fail, that's what causes varicose vein, right? So when these valves fail, you'll get um, a collection of blood in the lower extremities because the valves aren't holding them at a certain elevation as they get pushed up. Um, treatment for varicose veins, you can look at like compression socks. Those are like socks that just, um, you know, put pressure on your, on your limbs at a certain, you know, magnitude of pressure. And that helps to hold, you know, it helps to support the veins, yeah. I think there's a couple of things that they contribute to it. Number one is like simply just the appearance of um, being more vascular, so when you have less fat on your body, like all those veins that are there are much more visible. I mean, they're there in everybody, but they're just much more visible in a leaner person. But in addition, like through exercise, you know, your body responds to that, right? So the, the increased um, just need for blood to be circulated through your body, it's going to stimulate the um, growth of, of and development of veins, right? So I think it's like twofold, right? It's your body's response to um, increasing the amount of blood flow, but also just the appearance, you know? If it's someone who's lean, you can kind of see everything, right? Same with the muscles, right? The only reason someone who's lean looks muscular is because they just don't have a lot of adipose tissue on top of those, those muscles, you know? Um, back to varicose veins, so um, one way to treat them is that they remove them, okay? And, um, and so they'll just, uh, they'll kill the vein with uh, lasers or certain chemicals, I believe, and they can just remove it, right? Now, um, this is not a problem because the veins that suffer from this are usually superficial and they carry such a small proportion of the total blood back to the heart in relative to like your deeper, more major veins, like your saphenous vein, that the removal of some superficial veins really doesn't do anything to the circulation, right? I mean, it's a very minor uh, impact. Um, next thing that happens is that we have what's called the muscular pump. And what we'll, we'll find is that around our largest veins, you'll find these really large muscles. So our largest veins are going to be situated between some really large muscles of our limbs. When a muscle contracts, what happens to its length? Shorter. 
If it gets shorter, what happens to its width? Wider. So every time this muscle contracts, he gets wider. This guy does the same thing, he gets wider. If there was blood in this chamber, it gets squeezed. Can't go down because of the valve. It has to go up. So every muscle contraction pumps blood up a segment of the vein. That's going to increase the venous return. So when you exercise, you're really accelerating the speed of blood returning to the heart. And if you remember, if we do this, that's going to dump more blood into the heart at a higher rate, and it's going to fill the ventricles up more. That's going to increase our starting stroke volume, or our beginning stroke volume, which increases cardiac output, which is all good. Another thing that happens is we have the respiratory pump. Respiratory system, Boyle's Law. When you inhale, you contract your diaphragm, you contract your external intercostal muscles. What happens to the volume of your chest? Increases. Volume goes up, what happens to pressure? Down. Pressure goes down, that pulls air in, right? Well, what's right beside your lungs? Your, your heart, right? Your, hump, your heart's right there. You ever seen somebody who's like super angry? yelling, screaming, like arguing or something. What's their face look like? Red. When they get real mad, what happens to their veins and their neck? <laughs> right. What are they not doing? They're keeping up breathing. So they're keeping the pressure in their thoracic cavity high because they're not inhaling. That is literally preventing the blood from draining back to the heart. The pressure is high, it's higher than it is in the veins, and the blood starts pooling in the veins. Finally, they take a breath. Pressure drops, it can come back in. That helps to pull blood back to the heart when we're not contracting muscles. And that's really important, you know? Like when you're just sitting around, it's that respiratory pump that's helping to pull the blood back to the heart. Last, we'll have what's called the arterial pump. Arterial pump. Remember we're looking at, um, the arteries and vessels, we're trying to learn those guys. And you remember how I said I would never put the arteries and vessels on the same picture? Because they're like right on top of each other and it would be the most confusing thing ever. Especially if I didn't color code it. That would be like the hardest test ever. Right? <laughs> it's just like a black and white arteries on veins. That's even harder than actuality because you can kind of tell the difference between arteries anyway. But um, the reason they're right on top of each other, so imagine these large muscular and elastic arteries. Every time the heart beats, they expand a little bit. Right? If they expand and an artery is right next to a vein, every time that artery expands, the vein compresses. Well, every time that vein compresses, he's going to push a little bit of blood in the opposite direction. So that's going to help with our, our largest kind of arteries and veins. All these guys together, they help to get blood back to the heart, and we're good to go. Okay? So, you guys are actually lucky because typically, the quiz on the vessels is the hardest quiz of the whole class. And you guys don't even take it because our next class is the test. So that, that's actually a, a good thing for you guys. You don't have to take that very hard quiz. But the, the quiz actually helps prepare you for the test. So I'm going to give you some hints about how to think about this stuff as you prepare for the test. I mean, we went over a lot of information here. And it's tricky stuff. Let's say I ask you a couple questions regarding all these vessels. Which vessel experiences the highest pressure of all those? Uh, Elastic arteries. And that's easy because the pressure is highest here. Don't forget that. That's like an easy one. Okay? Where is blood flow the, where is blood flow the slowest? Capillaries. Okay? But wait, is, is it slower than the veins? That's a trick question. Yes. Right? Because the surface area in the capillaries is still so high. Right? I mean, who has greater surface area? The veins or the capillaries? The capillaries. And that causes velocity to go way down. Okay. Um, okay, good. Where, um, well, I mean, simple stuff, like which one has the highest proportion of smooth muscle? That would be the muscular arteries. Which vessel only consists of uh, the tunica intima? Capillaries. Good. Okay. Um, which vessel has the fastest blood flow? Elastic arteries. 
Okay, blood blood moves the fastest in the elastic arteries. Um, okay, good. Things like that. For these equations, you can either memorize the equations or memorize the take-home message. Okay, resistance goes up, blood flow goes down. Pressure goes up, blood flow goes up. And then this guy is really important. There's going to be a, qu a couple questions about this. Just talking about how blood pressure changes. Like, which of the following situations would cause blood pressure to increase? Heart rate goes down. Loss of blood. Diameter of the vessels. I don't know. Let me start over. Which one of the following would cause blood pressure to increase? Heart rate goes down. Stroke volume increases. Or blood volume decreases. Stroke volume. Stroke volume increases. The way you navigate through that is you just remember this guy and you can just work it out. Okay? Alright, that's it for this lecture.